started. Welcome everybody. This is the Department of Internal Medicine Grand Rounds. Today is October 26, 2023. And we have a very special lecture today, the annual Kessler Lecture, sponsored by the Division of Rheumatology, Allergy, and Immunology. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Dr. Nihal Shaw is going to introduce the annual Kessler Lecture and our speaker, Dr. Robert Hallwell. Hold on one second. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to welcome you all for, as Dr. Bergman said, this is our annual Kessler Lecture. Uh, a little bit introduction on the Kessler Lecture. So Kessler Lecture was started by general support from Kessler family in honor of Lucille and Marvin Kessler in 2016. And we have had great speakers since then. And this year is no different. We are very excited to introduce Dr. Robert Hallowell for today's 2023 Kessler Lecture, and he comes to us from Massachusetts General Hospital. He's a pulmonary critical care physician there, where he is a director of the interstitial lung disease clinic, uh, clinics and uh, pulmonary ambulatory clinics. He, uh, he did his medical degree in Colum from Columbia University. He did his internal medicine residency and pulmonary critical care fellowship, both from the John Hopkins Hospital. His research focuses on factors that influence outcomes in patients with various types of interstitial lung disease, particularly those associated with autoantibodies and rheumatic disorders. He's very well published and well accomplished and we are very excited to have you. So without uh, further delay, I'll let him start. Thank you. Well, thank you for that warm welcome. And um, it's been a great welcome here to Richmond so far. I know there's been a lot of behind the scenes work and planning to get me here. A lot of emails on your part. Um, I know what goes into something like this. I promise to leave this up for a few seconds. Um, so thank you for all that. Um, everybody has the numbers they need? Yeah, okay. So I'm going to talk about myositis-associated interstitial lung disease, some of the diagnostic and treatment challenges that we face with this actually relatively diverse population, even though it's a very niche group of patients, uh, they can present in a diverse number of ways, um, and they're quite challenging. And to approach them, you really need a really good team approach between rheumatologists and pulmonologists. And so I think it's a very fitting um, environment to talk about them here today. These are my disclosures. Um, I do have some industry ties, primarily through a couple lectures and a lot of um, ILD-focused clinical trials. Um, I direct the ILD Collaborative. I'm on the advisory board for the Myositis Association. Um, and maybe most importantly, um, I'm not a rheumatologist, um, and that's important to keep in mind, um, but they are my favorite doctors. Um, and if I was to do it all over again, I'd probably do a rheumatology fellowship. So we're gonna talk about the significance, is, the significance of ILD as a complication of the inflammatory myopathies. We'll talk about some of the diagnostic challenges presented by these patients. And then we'll talk about some treatment strategies towards the end. The idiopathic inflammatory myopathies in general include what you see here. Um, inclusion body myositis typically is not considered to be associated with interstitial lung disease. Although if we really wanna get into the weeds, that can be challenged, um, but I'll save that for another day in another lecture. Um, and then polymyositis, for those who believe in that definition, again, we could spar over that uh, on a different day. Um, dermatomyositis and amyopathic dermatomyositis, patients who have clinical and classic skin manifestations, but not as much overt muscle findings, um, these are the patients who really can present with overt pulmonary findings. So this is where we're going to focus today. So I want to start with a case. Um, now, interestingly, this is one of the very first cases I took care of as an attending um, many, many years ago. Um, so I was just a fledgling. Um, it was a 53-year-old woman, and she came in with dyspnea and cough, like just about every patient who comes to our clinic. She had a negative rheumatologic review of systems. 
She didn't smoke, um, but she lived in New Hampshire and she raised chickens. And to a pulmonologist, this is a massive red flag. So we hear chickens, we hear birds, red flags go up. She had crackles on exam. And again, to a pulmonologist, crackles actually are quite specific for hypersensitivity pneumonitis. HP will crackle, asthma will not, asthma will wheeze, HP will not. This is not a lecture about HP, so spoiler alert, she does not have hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Um, but she had no rashes, she had normal joints. Now again, I'm not a rheumatologist, so when I look for effusions and I'm you know, doing this thing that you all do much better than I do on your room exam, it's not as sensitive as yours, but I try, right? She did not have any weakness, at least no, no obvious proximal muscle weakness. And she actually had a biopsy up in New Hampshire. And the biopsy was read as being either an NSIP pattern of disease. So this is a, a pattern where the pathologist will describe a mix of some inflammatory changes. So an infiltrate of lymphocytes and maybe some infiltrate of um, fibrotic changes um, or scarring as well versus possible hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Interesting. And she came with this CAT scan. Um, and notably, I'm showing you the upper lobes here because she had quite a bit of upper lobe disease and hypersensitivity pneumonitis for those sitting for medicine boards tends to favor the upper lobe. So it was a pretty good story actually for hypersensitivity pneumonitis. She actually came with a pretty extensive serologic panel as well. Um, you can see here, she had a negative ANA and some other extractable nuclear antigens. Um, she had an HP panel that was negative, but this can be neither sensitive nor specific. Um, her aldolase and CK were normal. And she also had a negative GEL1 antibody, which tends to be the most common myositis antibody sent by most people. And her local pulmonologist, seeing this sort of inflammatory presentation on PATH, had put her on three grams of mycophenolate, which is a pretty good amount of immunosuppression, and 40 milligrams of prednisone. And she still wasn't feeling better. So she came to me for a second opinion. So being who I am and what I do, I couldn't resist the urge to send just one more vial of blood. Um, and I sent a myositis panel. Now, at the time, we were using the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation panel, which I think you may use here as well. I waited two months because that's often how long it takes to get this panel back. And it came back positive for a myositis specific antibody called anti PL7. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and this is an antibody we see in patients who can have myositis or a myositis spectrum of disease. I reviewed the pathology again in person with one of our pathologists who specializes specifically in interstitial lung disease. And this is an important point to keep in mind because this is a very unique skill set. And if you don't have a pathologist who specializes in lung disease, there are subtle findings that, that can be missed or misinterpreted. And here it was clear that this was a case of NSIP. And I think the reason that hypersensitivity pneumonitis was entertained is because there was some inflammation around the airways and there was maybe a single granuloma scene, but overwhelmingly this was a pattern consistent with NSIP. There were also some germinal centers and conglomerates of inflammation in a pattern that's actually quite typical for patients who have an underlying connective tissue disease. So all in all, the story fit for a patient who could have a connective tissue disease or an underlying autoimmune inflammatory process affecting their lungs. So what did I do? Well, so I started her on IVIG. Um, so intravenous immunoglobulins and her lungs improved. Now, I'd rather be lucky than smart any day. Um, this is not to say that every patient who has this presentation and who gets IVIG is gonna improve. And we'll talk about some data later, um, but she was feeling better. You can see her CAT scan on the left is the old one. There's more haziness, what we call ground glass. There's also more reticulation. That's that kind of lace-like pattern. Um, reticulation comes from the Latin reticularis, meaning a little net. So whenever you see that like net lace-like pattern, those are the reticulations. And that can be inflammation or scarring. And in this case, it tended to be more inflammation because a lot of that got better. And she felt a lot better. So I felt good about myself, right? I was high-fiving, this was great, everything looked good. 
but she wanted to reduce her mycophenolate as well. She said, I feel great. Can we come down on the immunosuppression? And I thought, sure, why not? Everything's going well. So nine months into this, as we did this and we came down on the mycophenolate, that's when she developed periorbital swelling. She had a little discoloration around her eyes, maybe a la heliotrope rash, if you want a buzzword. She also got a facial rash um, on her cheeks, around her nose, kind of like a malar rash, almost what you'd see more in, in lupus patients, interestingly. And then her CK became elevated into the 1500 range. And so now she has more of this classic dermatomyositis presentation, which she had never had before. When patients come into the clinic and they come with this, now some of these I lifted from the web because they were easier. Some of these are from our clinic patients. But in general, when patients come in and they have classic ulcerations, these punched out ulcers on the palmar surfaces of their hands or punched out ulcerations over their tendons, typical of dermatomyositis patients who have an MDA5 positive antibody, for instance, which we'll talk about, or they have a classic heliotrope rash, which mind you can be easily missed in patients who have darker skin tones or if they're simply wearing makeup. Classic Gautrin's, classic cracking of the skin, what we call mechanics hands, or a classic shawl sign. It's obvious, it's easy. And even if we don't necessarily know what's going on, we can say, well, there's something rheumatologic going on here. We should refer to rheumatology or seek help if we don't know how to treat this. But the problem is it's often not this obvious. And mechanics hands, for instance, can be incredibly subtle, right? It can start as just a little bit of roughness or thickening on the medial side of the index finger. Gotrin's, in my experience, in these patients, is often not classically this thick and this obvious. And it's often not always on the hands. It can be in other places on the arms. It's often misdiagnosed as eczema or psoriasis, even when they go to a dermatologist. The shawl sign is never a full shawl in these patients. It can be patchy, it can be on the back, and it can be you know, really hard to figure out what's, what's happening initially. So you have to have a high index of suspicion and look for these things. And often if you don't ask or look under the shirt or look closely, you'll miss it. I'm a big fan of Sir William Osler in part because of, of where I trained, but he said some wise things and that if you listen to your patient, they'll tell you the diagnosis. Now I'm not a art history major, I've never taken an art class, but I. I do like going to museums. And I also know that if you show artwork in your lectures, people will automatically assume you're smarter than you are. And so hence, um, but this is one of my favorite paintings of, of all time. And I think this is important because if you focus on the details here, this is a good lesson for how we have to approach these patients. And I'm not up here preaching to you that I do this right every time, but Every time I look at this picture, which I have, um, it reminds me of how I have to do this better. And this physician is listening to something that's important to the patient. She's also presumably nervous and you can see the rug is a little folded because she kind of like shuffled up to him and he's trying to break down a barrier. If a patient comes in to my clinic and they're referred for ILD, but they spend 30 minutes talking about some other complaint, some other joint ache, some other rash, the fact that they've had pruritus for the last three years, it's probably important and probably not something that should be overlooked, even though the clock is ticking. And I really just wanna to get to the fact that they have dyspnea or an abnormal CAT scan. So these are the most recent classification criteria for myositis. We don't have to go through all these. The point is there's a scoring system to determine whether there's a low probability, medium probability, or what's called definite inflammatory myositis. Definite being, you know, if your probability is 90% or greater. And they come up with a scoring system. And all I want to point out is that the only laboratory measure, the only um, myositis antibody that counts 
uh, as of the most recent update, is anti-GL1. So it's not the other myositis antibodies we'll talk about. And there's nothing on here about the lungs. So interstitial lung disease is not a classification criteria for myositis. And I want you to keep that in mind as we go through the rest of this lecture, because my bias is that the lungs are the most important organ, um, just because I'm a lung doctor. But majority of these patients actually present with lung disease or at some point develop lung disease, but it's not currently a, cr a classification criteria. Now, there are, you know, updates are going to come out on this and there are discussions about how to modify this, but I think this is an important thing to keep in the back of our minds. And so my threshold to order the myositis panel is low, um, in part because of this case. Um, when I speak to the rheumatology group again tomorrow, I'm going to try to needle them a little bit with some controversial comments and slides about why we order certain antibody panels um, when rheumatologists don't necessarily. Um, the idea being to spark conversation, not necessarily to teach anything. But one study here, I think, gets to the heart of this. And this is, I think, our own clinical experience as well. And in this study, they took 165 patients with, quote, idiopathic interstitial lung disease. 36% of them, 36% uh, of those were referred with a presumed diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, meaning presumably the providers thought that there was no underlying cause for their lung disease, and presumably the lung disease was thought to just be pure scar tissue progressing for unknown reasons. And a lot of these patients also, two thirds of them almost, had a negative ANA, RF, and CCP. And the reason I mention that is because there is this idea in the community that an ANA, RF, and CCP are the initial screening tools. And that if you send these antibodies and they're negative, then you're done. That you don't have to do any additional screening um, because ANA sometimes comes with a reflex panel of other extractable nuclear antigens that includes your SSA and Smith, et cetera. Um, and that if your RF and CCP are negative, it covers all the jointy stuff. And so if those are negative, you're golden. Well, it's actually not true because up to a quarter of these patients with idiopathic lung disease, a lot of them had these other negative antibodies, actually had a positive myositis specific antibody. And you can see here that these were actually pretty significant antibodies, row 52, JO1, PL7, PL12, other antisynthetase antibodies that we'll talk about. So if you go looking for them, you'll find them. And some of them actually end up being clinically significant. Um, as the case illustrated. So what are these antibodies? So they're the coolest antibodies out there. So these are the most interesting things in medicine. Um, and if you don't believe me, ask a rheumatologist. And if the rheumatologist doesn't agree, ask another rheumatologist. Um, so most of you have probably heard about anti gel one um, associated with dermatomyositis, increased risk of arthralgias, et cetera. But then there are several others, PL7, PL12, EJ, OJ. Those are the ones that are commercially available. And then there's some other more esoteric ones, which really are just academic. They're not typically in your normal myositis panel that you might order and that would come back. So why are they called antisynthetase antibodies? So I'm going to take you back to science class a little bit here in biology. But as you know, there's 20 amino acids. And amino acids are charged to their specific transfer RNA, which has the anticodon, which meets the codon on the messenger RNA in order to, to make um, proteins. And so this amino acid, when it gets attached to its corresponding transfer RNA, that attachment, that reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme, which is called amino acid transfer RNA synthetase, right? So those are the synthetases, those enzymes that attach these amino acids onto their transfer RNA. And so anti-synthetase antibodies, these are antibodies targeting each of those enzymes that catalyzes these attachments of the amino acids. So there's 20 amino acids. In theory, there are potentially 20 anti-synthetase antibodies out there of which we've discovered eight of them. My dream is maybe to discover the ninth, we'll see. Um, <laughs> In addition to those eight antisynthetase antibodies, um, including Joe jo one, 
there are these other two antibodies that are actually of incredible clinical significance. One is anti-MDA5 associated with significant lung disease. We'll talk a little bit about that. The other is also called Rho52, also associated with significant lung disease and skin manifestations. Those two tend to go together. So MDA5 and Rho52, they, they kind of skip hand in hand a lot of the time um, when you look at clinical series. Um, they're pretty common in myositis patients, um, and they're both associated with worsening lung disease. So how do patients present when they have either an anti-synthetase antibody or an MDA5 antibody? And I, I kind of lump them together at times. And the answer is it's the, the full spectrum. Um, some patients are diagnosed incidentally and have mild disease. Other patients can present with acute interstitial pneumonia or ARDS, fulminant respiratory failure. You can have this sort of NSIP pattern, which is more of an inflammatory process. You can have a UIP pattern. This is what would be IPF if they didn't have an underlying connected tissue disease. So this is more of a scar, a progressive scarring process with less inflammation on pathology if we were to do a biopsy. And MDA5 in particular is known for having this kind of like patchy, mothy in appearance on CAT scan. And MDA5 patients in particular and patients who have dermatomyositis are exquisitely sensitive to developing pneumomediastinum um, and pneumothoraces when they get hospitalized. Um, why this is, we're not entirely sure, but we think it might be because they have increased capillary breakdown and in inflammatory changes along the, the vascular bundles um, and bronchovascular bundles in the lung. We can also see organizing pneumonia patterns. So these migratory infiltrates that come and go, which tend to be a bit more responsive to immunosuppression. So really you can see the whole range radiographically. Well, what about pathologically? Now we don't do a lot of biopsies in these patients. The general rule of thumb um, as a pulmonologist is if you have a positive antibody, if you know a patient has myositis, you don't need to do a biopsy because um, we know there's gonna be some degree of inflammation there. We know they're gonna probably need immunosuppression and doing a biopsy actually increases the risk of a flare and bad outcomes. So we tend not to send these patients to our surgeons or to our interventional pulmonologist. That being said, biopsies do happen sometimes because like in the case I presented, we don't know patients have myositis initially and so they get a biopsy or patients get biopsies for other reasons. So one of the studies we did was we went back and we pulled all these cases retrospectively across the literature and looked at the patterns. And despite the notion that connective tissue disease is associated with inflammation and NSIP, you can see that there is actually quite a big range here um, with UIP or more fibrotic pattern actually being quite common, um, organizing pneumonia, acute lung injury, and others, LIP, et cetera, also being represented here. We also looked to see whether or not there were trends across antibodies, right? So whether you had different um, anti-synthetase antibodies, are there patterns that are more likely to pop up? Um, and some trends did emerge. Um, now, granted, this is retrospective. There's gonna be sampling bias here and referral bias here, um, but there do seem to be some patterns. For instance, if you have a KS or an EJ antibody, you may be more likely to have an NSIP pattern then let's say Joe one or PL12, or maybe UIP might be more common in, in those subsets. Again, the series are small enough where I'm, all, you know, even though we thought there was some statistical difference with some of these and we published it, I'm, I'm still hesitant to say definitively um, that each unique antibody has a true pathologic phenotype. Well, how common is interstitial lung, lung disease in patients with myositis? Well, it depends on the series, depends on the antibodies. Um, the prevalence can range anywhere from 20 to 80%. But if you look at patients who have an anti-synthetase antibody, those series will give you anywhere from the 70s up to 100% of patients reported have some degree of interstitial lung disease. So it's very common. ILD precedes the diagnosis of myositis in up to a third of patients. So from a pulmonary a pulmonologist perspective, patients come to us with ILD, the onus is on us to look for an underlying myositis. 
as a rheumatologist or a general practitioner, if you have a patient that you think has signs of dermatomyositis or myositis, you have to be really vigilant and monitor their lungs with breathing tests, CAT scans, et cetera, because there's a really good chance, depending on their antibody profile, that they could develop lung problems down the road. And their lung problems are probably what's going to get them into trouble. This is proven here. If you have ILD and myositis, it's associated with death. Patients don't die of their joint problems or their rashes. Those are problematic. But if you're going to die, it's going to be from your lung disease. I think it's obvious why that would be, um, but I think it's worth mentioning here. Certain antibodies definitely carry a worse prognosis. MDA5 is one of them. And it's in part because these patients tend to develop a rapidly progressive form of ILD, where over the course of a few weeks or a few months, their pulmonary function declines rapidly. They end up in a hospital. And once these patients are in the hospital, they don't do well. MDA5 is also interesting because it seems to be more common in Asian cohorts. Some of this is a bit of reporting bias because a lot of the research on MDA5 comes out of Japan and the Japanese are the leaders in myositis research. But even aside from that, it does seem to be more common in those cohorts. And we do think, at least based on other research coming out of different MDA5 co cohorts here in America and elsewhere, that having an MDA5 antibody tends to portend worse prognoses in Asians versus non-Asians when they have it. This is one of my favorite studies, even though it's, it's small, um, but this shows that some of the clinical features associated with MDA5, worse outcomes, respiratory failure, and these classic skin findings, punched out ulcers, severe skin disease, palmar papules, may actually be more associated with the row 52 that goes with MDA5 than the MDA5 itself. I think more work needs to be done on this, but in a study, they showed that higher titers of MDA5 and or the presence of row 52 is really what drove rapidly progressive ILD numbers and the cutaneous ulcerations. Now, causal versus associative is a totally different thing. And so we won't get into the weeds on that. If you develop respiratory failure in the ICU, you don't do well. Um, and you can see the probability of survival is extremely low. Um, this is true for, for most ILD flares. Um, all comers in ILD flare, if you end up on a ventilator, your probability of survival is probably 10%. Um, and it's even worse with MDA5 patients in general. Um, what's interesting here is that antisynthetase patients tended to do better than MDA5 patients. I pulled this particular study. There are many that, many that look this way, but because um, this one gave pretty good numbers, only 20% of these patients presented with an elevated CK. And so if you're looking to use a CK level as a metric for whether or not patients maybe are presenting with a myositis or an undiagnosed myositis, it's not really reliable. Some other data I didn't put here, but a paper we have in for publication now under review with revision is looking at all comers with respiratory failure and how many of them have undiagnosed myositis. And we ran a myositis panel on all of them. And we had a hit rate of 25%. And we felt all smug and smart about this. But then we looked at our control group of patients in the ICU who don't have respiratory failure, and we have a myositis hit rate of 25%. And this is pre-COVID. And so this notion that we can use these markers as a way of knowing why patients necessarily even have respiratory failure is probably not true. And the notion that COVID is inducing all these new autoimmune phenomenon and driving new autoantibody conversion, maybe not, it may not be true either because this was all happening even before the COVID era. My daughter's obsessed with rabbits and I promised her I'd find a way to work rabbits into my talk. So this is for Asha, but there's a purpose here. Things are not always as they seem. Um, and this is especially true in our myositis patients and they can be tricky. And so, the pathophysiology here loves to keep us on our toes and to keep us humble. 
And I think that's partly why I love doing what I do, because at least once a week or several times a month, I'm reminded of how challenging this can be um, and how often we don't get it right, um, even though we're putting our heads together and working in a multidisciplinary way. So remember the little worm here and, and the rabbits. If you remember nothing else from my talk, remember the rabbits and the carrots um, and Norman Rockwell. So those are the takeaways, rabbits and Norman Rockwell. So the lungs can have a mind of their own. Um, and I think if you step back for a second and think about your practices and what you've seen clinically, you'll recall many instances where this is true. The lungs like to march to the beat of a different drum. So here's a woman, again with PL7, I just picked on PL7, there's no pattern here, so don't read into that. Um, she came with joint pains, fevers, rash, um, improved after immunosuppression. We were able to taper, taper her prednisone and she remained on full dose mycophenolate. Um, uh, to the rheumatologist in the room, yes, we always use like three grams of mycophenolate up front. It may sound like a lot. Um, that's what we do. Um, she had a worsening dry cough and dyspnea when carrying her laundry up the stairs. And this is her repeat CAT scan. So it's pretty clear that her lungs look worse, right? There's just more white, right? We don't want to see white stuff on the CAT scan. Um, there's more reticulation, right? That's that lacy stuff little net, um, maybe some more ground glass, but the lungs are worse. Like, how are the lungs worse when we're controlling her fevers and rash and joint pains, right? Like she's better, right? She's rheumatologically better. How is this possible? And this happens all the time, right? So, you know, we'll be talking to the rheumatologist and we're high-fiving and we're feeling so good and the patient feels better. And then the lungs are getting worse behind the scenes. And we see this not just with myositis, we see it with every connective tissue disease that we treat. This is also, I think, the reason that the lungs are the hardest organ to transplant. It's easy to transplant a kidney or a heart or some other organ that's all nice and contained and happy, but the lungs are exposed to the environment continuously and they have a very high level of innate immunity. All these resident macrophages and lymphocytes, everything in there, you got a ton of lymph nodes in the chest, right? And the lungs are just waiting for any reason to rev up their immune response and complain about something and fire away, right? And so lungs are hard to transplant. The rejection rate's high, chronic rejection, average lung life expectancy post-transplants, five years. It's not true for other organs. Um, and because of this, I think you need more immunosuppression to treat the lungs than other parts of the body, and the lungs will do their own thing. And we see this clinically, and it's something to keep in mind. Now, conversely, don't always blame the lungs. It's not always their fault. So here's a woman who had anti jo one positive interstitial lung disease, progressive dyspnea over several months. Her FVC decreased. She couldn't do a DLCO because she just felt like she couldn't do the breath maneuver. So it wasn't because of coughing. And so I got a repeat CAT scan. And I did not copy the same image twice. These are actually different. And you can see there's a different date there, 2017, 2018. People at home maybe can zoom in, but those are different CAT scans, but they're pretty close, right? There's no change in her parenchyma. So what's going on? Well, now we get to blame rheumatology. So now her CK, despite the fact that her lungs are happy, her CK went up and we did what's called MIPS and MEPS. So these are maximal inspiratory pressures or maximal expiratory pressures. So these are you know, the kind of force you can generate from your respiratory muscles. She's weak. So she has muscle, severe muscle disease and that's why she's short of breath. Those kind of patients tie into this case. Why do you have refractory myositis in a patient who should be doing well? What is driving refractory muscle disease in these patients? Well, here's a sad case, and we see this too, unfortunately. So here's a woman, again, Joe 1, antisynthetase syndrome, initially came with lung disease, joint disease, muscle disease. Her imaging and everything improved after a year of therapy, or she had been on therapy for a year. She's on full dose mycophenolate. And you can see her lungs look pretty good here, right? So there's minimal reticulation. 
you can see here, there's actually this like remaining haze where there actually used to be quite a bit of ground glass and reticulation and it's cleared up. For the pulmonologists in the room, I don't know if there's any here, but there's actually what we call subpleural sparing. So right along the pleura, it actually looks normal. And that's a classic finding for an NSIP pattern. So this was responsive disease. But then in here on the left side, you see this nodule. And on PET scan, with weight loss, myositis gets worse, and now she has an adenocarcinoma. So she gets cancer. Well, cancer is actually common in patients with inflammatory myositis. And you know, we learn this in medical school and residency that dermatomyositis especially, but all the inflammatory myositis can be associated with an increased risk of malignancy. Well, how common is it? And how much do we have to think about this? Well, if you look at certain series, um, you know, I pulled a couple here, but it's pretty common across the board. It probably runs somewhere in the teens. I don't think, you know, it's necessarily in the 30s, but it's probably somewhere in the teens. That's pretty high. And if you look at the percent diagnosed after the myositis diagnosis, um, it's probably the majority of them. But this can really drive the process. It can drive the lung process. It can drive the muscle process. We have many, many cases where patients diagnosed with a lymphoma or some other malignancy that was able to be you know, treated successfully and their muscle disease melted away completely and their lung disease actually melted away and they came off all immunosuppression. That's not the norm, but it does happen. And it's something to keep in mind when you're faced with a patient whose disease is just incredibly refractory. Get a PET scan if you can get it covered by insurance um, because you're sometimes missing something. So to summarize some of these clinical pearls here, don't interpret a declining FVC in isolation. Think about muscle weakness. Relevant myositis can develop after ILD um, in a significant number of patients, depending on the series. An improving vital capacity can actually give false reassurance as the muscle disease response to therapy, right? So we talked about the converse, but also sometimes your PFTs look better and you think their lungs are getting better when it's actually just their muscles improving. So keep that in mind. And always keep malignancy in the back of your mind as well, especially in some of these refractory cases. And these patients definitely at a minimum need routine annual screening, mammograms, colonoscopies, et cetera, every five years. All right, so we've made the diagnosis. You've all been incredibly thoughtful. You've listened to your patients and we know what we have, right? Now, my wife's an oncologist and she always knows what her patients have. She won't see a patient unless they have a tissue diagnosis and like genetic profiling and everything. So she never even thinks about what the diagnosis is, right? It's all just horrendous management decisions that I like, she's 20 times smarter than me, right? So she's doing internal medicine, like on a scale I couldn't imagine. I spend most of my time trying to figure out what patients have and how to approach that. So in the rare event that we actually make an accurate diagnosis and we know exactly what kind of ILD they have or where patients come, these are actually rare occasions, right? Despite our multidisciplinary conference, but we finally get here. How do we manage these patients? Well, the data actually is not that robust. So I'm gonna show you some data, but we don't have large studies. Um, there's certainly not a lot of randomized control trials. We don't have the numbers because these are pretty rare conditions, um, but we have a sense. And I think there's some signal through the noise here of how to approach these patients. Myositis can be stabilized by a variety of agents. The purpose of showing this slide in general is to say that Cyclophosphamide, azathioprine, mycophenolate seem to be equivalent. More importantly, you don't need to use cyclophosphamide to treat your myositis ILD patients, um, I think is the take home message. Um, they can all be steroid sparing agents, get you down off prednisone um, and stabilize lung function. And in some cases we can, we can actually improve lung function quite significantly. This was a study um, from our peers at Hopkins looking at azathioprine versus mycophenolate specifically in this retrospective study. Um, essentially, it was a wash. Um, there was no real difference. 
um, between the two. There were more adverse events in the azathioprine group. It's a common theme we see in a lot of studies. It's just not quite as well tolerated as mycophenolate. Um, and the azathioprine group actually started with a higher prednisone need. Um, so there's some caveats here. But in general, they're thought to be interchangeable. I just find mycophenolate a little bit easier to use. We talk about tacrolimus a lot. Um, a lot of the data for tacrolimus comes again out of Asia, notably Japan. Um, they're kind of the leaders on this. They use a lot of tacrolimus in part because they don't have access to rituximab the same way we do. Um, and so there's a lot of reporting bias on tacrolimus. That being said, um, there are studies like this one showing that patients who receive tacrolimus within 28 days versus conventional therapy where tacrolimus is added or tacrolimus is not used at all, that patients maybe have better outcomes. Again, these are smaller studies. They're retrospective. Um, we need to take them with a grain of salt, but there is maybe a signal here. Additionally, again, the timing of using calcineurin inhibitors, whether we treat early with cyclosporin or delay, um, again, small studies here, but a possible signal um, that given giving this mechanism of treatment might be beneficial in myositis patients. It's thought that tacrolimus maybe works faster than the antimetabolites, mycophenolate and azathioprine, so that's one possibility. Um, it is a different mechanism of action as well. And there are meta-analyses looking at the use of tacrolimus in general in patients with myositis who have had any tacrolimus exposure versus not. Um, tend to have better um, improvements in FVC. Um, DLCO is not statistically significant, but CK levels improve as well. So there might be something here, and we do tend to use it in our sickest patients, at least in our practice. Well, what about rituximab? Um, so again, there's retrospective data um, looking at patients pre and post treatment. Um, who had failed steroids, had failed cyclophosphamide or mycophenolate. So these were thought to be refractory patients. Um, so it's important to keep that in mind as a population. And you can see here that after they had gotten treatment, um, the red dots are patients who had myositis in this cohort um, of connective tissue disease patients. And there was a bump um, in their average force vital capacity and diffusion capacity. Um, again, implying that we can use rituximab in these patients, um, even if they have refractory disease, and we do so. Um, and again, I'm going to make a plug here that compared to cyclophosphamide, um, rituximab is certainly not inferior um, and may have better outcomes. It's certainly, I think, less toxic. Um, and so I don't think there's necessarily a reason to use something that's more toxic like cyclophosphamide in these patients when we have alternative agents. I use a lot of IVIG. Um, we've published on this and we do it pretty liberally. Um, IVIG is proven in other autoimmune conditions. Um, it's shown to impact muscle disease in this, in this group. Um, there's now some emerging data. Um, this is an ongoing project of ours as well, um, looking at outcomes. I think the biggest challenge um, looking at data with IVIG is it's almost never given alone or as monotherapy. And so there's always a lot of confounding information. All these patients have always received multiple other agents um, in addition to their IVIG and the timing of when these other agents kick in, um, when they take several weeks or months to have their full effect on these patients. That makes it hard to know how effective the IVIG itself is. Um, but here you can see in this study, patients who, regardless of other therapy, but however standard therapy is defined, um, patients who had received IVIG in general did better um, than patients who did not. And this is a cohort of patients with MDA5, antibody positivity, and rapidly progressive ILD. Um, and you can see they had much better remission rates um, than standard therapy. Um, Tofacitinib, um, JAK kinase inhibitor, is um, kind of one of the latest to be studied in this realm. Um, and there's some data that compared to um, historical controls and then um, some other data showing that it's maybe beneficial for some of the sickest patients with MDA5 and rapidly progressive lung disease. Um, there's hesitation using this agent just in, in part because of its uh, side effects. There's a black box warning for cardiovascular events. Um, so we've been a little hesitate to use this, hesitant to use this. Um, you know, I'd be curious to hear what 
how often rheumatology uses this in general in their practice, um, depending on whom you speak to, there's wide variability here. Um, I think more research needs to be done here for at least for our sickest cohorts. Um, and then other things we consider are things like plasma exchange. And so again, here, you know, there, there's growing literature, mostly in small retrospective data sets, looking at the use of plasma exchange. The idea being, can you remove the bad humors from the blood? Can you lower, for instance, MDA5 levels, levels correlating to disease severity, probably causal, not um, probably associative, not causal rather, um, but when they do plasma exchange on these patients, their ferritin levels come down and inflammatory markers come down and their CRPs come down. And you know there, there are studies showing that patients do better. Now, granted, there are also studies looking at plasma exchange that do not show a mortality benefit. But in all those studies, the patients who got plasma exchange were on average sicker than the ones who didn't. And so it's a little hard to tease out the signal from the noise. Plasma exchange is relatively easy to do. Um, I would argue it's as safe as a ventilator. I would argue it's as safe as the medicines we give our patients when they're crashing in the ICU and we're throwing on three immunosuppressants. Um, so I think it needs to be studied more rigorously. Um, and I think it's worthy of IRB approval um, going forward to do larger, more robust studies uh, looking at this. And so when we think about these patients, um, we come up with these algorithms. And this is one that you know we put in chest recently. Um, this is not to go through or memorize, et cetera. But this is just to say that each patient is individual and we go through sort of this Plinko algorithm of how sick are they? How fast are they decompensating? What medicines are they already on? Are they failing current conventional immunosuppression? And what do we add on? So are we switching agents because we have time and maybe they're failing mycophenolate, so we should try something like tacrolimus or rituximab? Or are they getting hospitalized for an exacerbation where we really take approach of throwing agents on and adding? Um, and so we really take an additive approach here. You know, in sarcoidosis, let's say, we'll peel off an agent and add one on. When patients come in with a myositis flare, we have very little time to catch up and stop the disease before patients, before their lungs are off and running and we've reached a point of no return where they're going to die on a ventilator. And once you're on a ventilator with this condition, your chances of survival are really, really low, even with ECMO. Um, and so we tend to be incredibly aggressive with pulse dose steroids, IVIG, at least one antimetabolite, either mycophenolate or azathioprine, and then we'll add either rituximab or tacrolimus. And so it's not uncommon to see these patients on three, four immunosuppressive agents. And we've had great success doing this. We've had patients leave the hospital and walk into our clinic. Um, and so, you know, the... Interestingly, the rate of infection when we do this still tends to be lower than our outpatient pulmonary transplant patients, um, in part because I think it's just a different background. And there's something about transplanting a lung that makes you more susceptible to infection than coming in sick with a flare. Um, but these patients are sick um, and they, they need an aggressive approach, unfortunately. In the outpatient setting, despite immunosuppression over time, these patients also develop a fibrotic components. Um, so they get scar tissue in their lungs. And you can see this here. Um, some of the reticulation, some of what looks like ground glass or haziness actually can be fine fibrosis below the resolution of the CAT scanner. Um, we know there's fibrosis here now and that not all this is inflammation because you can see traction bronchiectasis. So these airways are now getting dilated and pulled apart. They're wider than they should be. If you remember when you were a med student and you decided you did not want to go into surgery, which I believe is why you're all here, none of you are surgeons, because you were doing traction and you're just like pulling, right? And you had those retractors. That's essentially what the scar tissue does to the airways. And so as the airways get thicker, or inflamed or scarred around each airway, it pulls them apart from all directions and so they get wider. And that's why we get traction bronchiectasis. And so we're seeing signs of that here. And that does not occur for the most part without some degree of fibrosis. And so some of this haziness is actually not inflammation. It's fine fibrosis. One of our ongoing projects right now in conjunction with our radiologists at MGH 
is we have a few hundred of these CAT scans and we have concurrent biopsies, surgical lung biopsies, and we're actually correlating what was called ground glass with the pathologic specimens to actually prove this, that what was called ground glass and treated with immunosuppression is actually fibrosis. Um, there's also some optical density studies where we're looking at this stuff now with optical tomography and proving that it's actually fine scar. Um, it's not inflammation. Um, so again, it can be very misleading. The lungs are tricky. Um, they're, they're tricky. So um, when these patients develop fibrosis, we think about using antifibrotic agents. Now, the inbuilt study um, was looking at nintendinib. So nintendinib was originally FDA approved to treat idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and then the inbuilt trial came out looking at the use of nintendinib. The brand name is OFEV. Um, in patients who had progressive fibrosing ILD that was not IPF. And you can see here that the force vital capacity over 52 weeks still declined in everybody, but it declined at roughly half the rate in patients who received nintendinib. Now you're going to say, well, did these patients have myositis? No, they did not have myositis. A quarter of them did have an autoimmune interstitial lung disease. So they were called autoimmune patients. So it was a good chunk of patients, um, but they did not have myositis. And the reason they didn't have myositis, and we were, um, I was the PI on this study, is because immunosuppression was not allowed, right? You were allowed like a little bit of prednisone and I think methotrexate, if I recall, but you were not allowed to be on azathioprine, mycophenolate, rituximab, any of the good stuff that we would need to treat our patients. So. We naturally, we're not going to stop immunosuppression to enroll them in the study. Um, and so it was not enriched for myositis patients. So we kind of extrapolate that like, well, it kind of worked for all these other patients. Um, there is the census trial that showed that this works in scleroderma. And so, you know, maybe it works in myositis too. Um, so there are ongoing clinical trials looking at this. And I'll call your attention to the one at the very bottom Um as a disclaimer, I'm on the steering committee for, and I'm also one of the site PIs for, um, this is called the MINT trial. Um, and this is through the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and the lead PI there actually was in my shoes here, one of these Kessler um, lecturers, um, Rohit Agarwal um, is the main leader of this trial. And this is looking at um, nintendinib specifically in myositis patients um, to answer this question. Um, how beneficial is nintendinib in patients with myositis? That aside, you can see there are several other studies looking at the benefits of various immunosuppression um, agents in patients who have myositis or connective tissue disease. Um, and so we're waiting to see what those trials bring. So I'll wrap up here um, with a couple minutes for questions. So in summary, ILD is common in myositis. It's the leading cause of morbidity and mortality. It can be subclinical or fulminant. We need a nuanced approach to diagnose this in certain patients. We really need to have our antennae up um, and it takes a multidisciplinary conference sometimes. Interpret changing symptoms in this patient population with a broadened differential. Our standard therapy is steroid sparing agents. Um, we tend not to just use prednisone. Um, I think I got that point across. I didn't say it explicitly, but these patients typically always get a steroid sparing agent. And I think we need more clinical trials um, to really kind of beef up the data that we have because a lot of it is retrospective. And so with that, um, I really thank you for your attention and for being here. I know it's an hour of your day and I appreciate you spending it with me. So I think we can start with some questions. We'll be here in the audience. Questions? Yes. I was intrigued by the myositis panel hit of 25%. Was there a pattern within those antibodies that raised any red flags or gave any trends to those who may actually be true ILD? Yeah. So the question was um, referring to the Fiddler trial where the patients referred with, quote, idiopathic interstitial lung disease were found to have a positive hit rate on their myositis panel of about 25% or so. And whether they're in that study, and I guess I would say even just in clinical practice, we see a trend um, maybe predicting which patients will actually go on to have clinically significant, um, either real myositis or, like, you know, 
do these antibodies matter, I guess, is that what you're getting at? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a really good question. So in that study, the actual diagnosis, at least in their multidisciplinary conference, changed, I think, about 10% of the time uh, in a clinical, meaningful way. Um, I would argue that, um, and we're going to talk about this tomorrow as well, I would argue that the presence of a high-risk antibody, a Rho 52 or an MDA5, is different than the presence of a lower risk antibody like a moderate titer ANA in isolation or a rheumatoid factor that's double titer, et cetera. And so I think the problem with that study is we don't know what happens three years later. They need to do a follow-up study um, to see how many of those patients two years down the road do develop other signs or even six months after trial because it's just a snapshot, right? It's just a cross-section. Um, so I think it's unknown. I do agree, though, um, that we are capturing sometimes clinically insignificant antibodies, and we'll send patients to rheumatology, um, and there's nothing to do, right? We're just kind of watching. And the presence of an antibody does not always mean we need to immunosuppress or do anything differently than we already are. Um, but I think the knowledge is important, especially, and I'll say this to patients, I'm going to do a bunch of blood work today. The result may not change anything I do between now and your next visit. However, there is a risk that your disease is going to change or flare. And if it does, having the knowledge of this antibody will absolutely change how I approach you if that day comes. Any other questions here? Yes? Any data regarding IL-6 at Temra? Yeah. Um, so there is data um, looking at Actemra in things like rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and so um, I think not necessarily in myositis, we don't have great data yet. I think what happens is, um, for instance, like a Batacept was a great example of how this happens. People start giving a Batacept for rheumatoid arthritis and they realize, oh, we have 30% of our patients also have ILD. And then retrospectively, we start getting an idea of how it happens. And then we can do more prospective studies using a Batacept, right? And so I think the same thing is gonna start happening with things like Ectemera. Um, So no, we don't have great data yet. I love nothing more when we have patients who have exhausted all agents and I'm working with Room and you say, well, what else can we try? And Room says, well, I wanna try something like Ectemera. Do you mind? And I say, no, because their lungs are stable. And then we try something and then their lung disease gets better. And this is how we, you know, essentially it turns into small case reports, case series, which, you know, people poo-hoo and laugh at, but this drives the needle. And and this is how we start learning things. So um, we'll get there, I think, with things like back time or two. Um, because there, there is data looking at, you know, impacts of IL-6 and predicting outcomes in scleroderma, et cetera, right? Because, you know, we have tocilizumab, et cetera. And so we think it maybe matters there. So I think it's a good question. Yeah. So I think what I can do with five positive patients. Do you think that um, those are the more for people with severe disease to be my That one patient and being young human patients not only a five, but the three of them also, one of them. Not a severe muscle disease, but severe skin disease, which we have gone through and a lot of conscious discussions about. So we went over traditional stuff, we did a top plan, all the agents, doesn't it work for them to make it You know, we just kind of, the dandy of five, it seems like they have yeah, that's a great question. So the question for the community um, is use of Zeljans and whether or not we have data that is more useful for patients who have more severe skin disease, uh, because the data I showed were in patients with MDA5 and fulminant respiratory disease, um, and those patients tend to have skin manifestations um, because the patient in question from the audience has an antisynthetase antibody, bad skin disease that failed traditional therapy and responded to Zeljans, right? Um, so I don't, I, I'm not aware of 
of good data using Zeljans in myositis, um, unless somebody in the rheumatology community does. Um, and so primarily, I'm only aware of use of Zeljans for the respiratory component of it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm more familiar with IVIG treating the severe skin stuff and that, that can work, but, but I think we're going to see more of this, you know, where the Zeljans kind of clears that up a little bit. Um, you know, interestingly, you know, the MDA5 patients, they tend to have this strong type one interferon response and, and how that all ties in with, you know, using some of these different agents that target different pathways. Um, but I, I think it's, you know, another interesting anecdote and things that we're going to start seeing more of as we use these agents. Um, and, you know, we may just get more comfortable using agents like Zeljans, despite their possible risks when patients are just really sick and really refractory and we don't have other options. Um, you know, the black box warning becomes less relevant when a patient is dying on a ventilator um, and you don't have another choice. Um, so, yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for coming. No, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, we'll be down here for one or two more minutes. If anybody else has any questions, please come down. Yeah. Most important question: Did you get your USB drive? I did. Okay. Yeah, I did. Got I, it. I, All right. <laughs> I did. I did. Good. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. What happened with the Zoom? I think it cut off at one o'clock. What's the recording? Then the Zoom is gone. It shut down. Oh, there it is. Oh, that's weird. So what happened? No, I think it's fine. For some reason, it looked like it. I was trying to stop the recording. It wouldn't let me stop it. Yes. <laughs>